Hi, everyone. Um, this is Product Fit, Airtime's uh, podcast series with exceptional product leaders and leaders in general telling behind the scenes stories. I'm Akos, the CEO of Airtime, a user engagement platform empowering product teams to improve product adoption by rapid validation of user needs. Today, my guest is Kate Towsey, research ops thought leader and advisor. She's the founder of the Cha Cha Club. Correct me if I'm wrong, it's the Cha Cha <laughs> Club. It's a member it club for research ops professionals. And she's, uh, she has ama had an amazing career at BBC Atlassian. I could go on uh, recounting these uh, milestones, but I think it's a good point to hand over the mic to you, Kate, if you could say a few words about yourself. Uh, first, thank you so much for inviting me to chat to you. I, I, um, anyone who knows me knows that you don't have to ask me twice to talk about research operations. Um, well, I've been working in, uh, I've been designing systems uh, without even knowing it since I was about 24, which is a long time ago now. Um, someone asked me to work on their e-commerce commerce site in 2004, which is before the iPhone, uh, around the time that Amazon emerged, <laughs> before any of us really understood just how ubiquitous this world of technology and 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 internet and digital and all those words, before we realized how ubiquitous it had become. And um, I remember very clearly him uh, coming around to my house. I was like, I'd been working as a radio journalist, didn't know very much about uh, the internet or anything really. I mean, who did at that point unless you actually worked in the space? And him showing me behind the website that he ran, how the e-commerce ran. He ran it on something called OS Commerce. And that was really my first introduction to the web, but also unbeknownst to me, my first introduction into uh, how you operate something. Um, and so I've been working on operations ever since. Um, and uh, through a long circuitous journey, fell into this space of helping researchers to uh, operate their world more efficiently and effectively. And uh, that's really been my, my sole work for the last uh, 10 years, 13 years. It's actually 2013 was, which was when I really fell into this work without knowing it. And it was in 2018, five years later, that I uh, um, put together the Research Ops community, which I no longer lead and haven't since, since 2019. Um, but then instigated the uh, what is research ops movement because I felt I, I, I'm not one to chit chat. Um, I'm okay at a dinner party, but I like to get onto like the business of doing something. Yeah. And so when I started a community and I saw that there was all this energy around it and, and people wanting to talk to each other and 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 you know, I wanted to turn this this energy into something tangible. Um, and that's really where the what is research ops movement came out of. We ran. Uh, as a as a crew, we ran, I think it ended up being 32 workshops or something around the world in 2018. Of course, it's now uh, five years since then. Um, I'm just quickly doing that calculation. Yes, we were in 2023. Yeah. And uh, in that time, I've, I've um, built uh, research operations for Atlassian globally. I've, I now no longer work for them. I'm now uh, working um, as a sole agent, a, a lone wolf and uh, loving life. Um, and uh, it, it was really interesting over that time to, to see what does this actually mean on the ground. When you get into a huge corporation, and that seems not as big as the IBMs, the Microsofts, the Apples, Googles, Metas of the world, um, but it's still a big, it's a, it's a big company and it's, and it's spread across the world. And, and they had, you know, very big investment in research. And so what does it mean to actually deliver these things in that kind of environment? And so I really got to learn not just about operations, but how do you manage a team? How do you manage a team of research operations people? How do you hire research ops people um, when there are very few people who actually have done this job for a very long time? Who do you look for? And so it was a really incredible opportunity to test, to really test the grit, you know, get down on the ground and actually figure out, like, how do you get this work done? Um, and it was an, an exceptional journey. So, you know, like that's me in a sort of a nutshell, I guess. This is super fascinating. And I think with you, we also heard an origin story of, of research ops. And there's, there's one thing which I'm, I'm very curious about. If you, we go back to 2018 or maybe even before that, uh, how did you, how did you develop a notion of what, what is good 
practice and research jobs and what is not, because there were no predecessors, or I guess you were inspired by, by people maybe from, from other industries or from, from other areas, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like an established field where you had like a number of books you could pick from the shelf that gave you uh, an idea of, okay, this is A, B, C, D, this is what you got to do, and then you have a decent research ops uh, set up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there, are, there, there, there were actually people doing research jobs at the time. I didn't know about them, so I didn't have them as inspiration. But just I always try and correct the record that that I invented research jobs. It did actually exist. I didn't know at the time that it existed. Only when I started to kind of have these conversations, it emerged that uh, places like Airbnb had had operations since I think 2019. Um, Hmm. Sooner, earlier than that, actually. Uh, they've had operations for, I think, 10 or 13 years. So I've got my timelines wrong there, but uh, a, a long time. Salesforce had had research operations for 10 or 20 years, something like that. I forget my dates. Decades anyway, you know, much longer than I had been around. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, certainly Microsoft had had some form of operations in research going on for 20 years. That I don't know for so sure. Big, big, big tech companies. Uh, big sounds tech to me. companies. Yeah, very big tech companies, very focused on scaling, on fast growth, um, have operations outfits in all other parts of the business and had been savvy enough to include operations in their vast research teams. Same thing goes for Meta, once was Facebook. Um, <laughs> but um, so, you know, to answer your, your question more directly, um, for me, it has been that those original investigations in 2018 was just understanding the basic architecture of what are the things that we need in the research environment to help researchers effectively do their work. And not only that, over the time, that's become a lot more nuanced than, than, than that for me. Um, I used to uh, sort of lead with the language of, of operations is here to help researchers do what they do best, which is research. Now, that is not untrue. But really what operations should be doing is, is it's not about the researcher, the individual researcher, and how effective their individual job is. Ideally, it's very effective because the, if the effectiveness of an individual will create a more effective collective, right, which is the research practice or the research team. Um, but really what we should be doing as operations is looking at the entire the practice, the business of research within the organization. How does that organization, which could be made up of 10 researchers, 50 researchers, 100 researchers, or many more, how does it function within the organization so that um, it's valued by the, by the business, uh, it's run really efficiently financially and otherwise, it really delivers value into the business that is seen and felt around the business. Um, and that, so it's not just about researchers being like, oh, recruitment's easy, yay tools are there that I need. Yay, these are great things. But we've also got people in the organization going, we could not live without research. It is so valuable to us that we uh, want to invest more, not mm -hmm. just in buying more researchers or you know, getting more headcount to have more researchers doing more research, but we get so much value out of the research that is being done because it is properly cataloged, it's, it's properly shared, it's properly circulated, it's um, you know, it's really trusted because there is great brand around research and all these things are set up so that it's deep, like the knowledge is deep. Um, I want to add one thing onto that. I, um, in writing a book, you are forced to think about the words that you use for things very carefully. And, and as a word nerd, I can go deep and, and I've had to like learn not to go deep. Otherwise, I'll be like, re like I researched for like a week what knowledge means according to like Plato. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a genre of uh, philosophy behind that. Uh, oh, that's huge. I mean, it's endless. Also, if there is knowledge at all, right? Uh, Ex exactly. I mean, all. it is a rabbit hole you'll never come out of and, and academics go in there and you never see them again. Um, so I had to drag myself out of the wormhole at some point and just go, just stick with the word knowledge, it's fine. <laughs> People will know what it means. But one of the, the words that I do flip between is research team and research practice. And I think that's really important because in the world that we're in, um, lots of different types of people do something called research. Now, you know, researchers will are highly specialized at what they do. And I'm the first person to say that it's research is not just chatting to customers. As if you can have a, a chat with your buddy, it doesn't mean that you're very, very good at research necessarily. There's real skill behind it. Um, and many, many people can learn those skills, including designers, product managers, content designers, and engineers, and the list goes on. So what research operations might be doing is looking after a research team, uh, 
and, and I, you know, you could define that as a formal team of bona fide full-time researchers. Um, and you could have research operations looking after a bona fide formal team of product managers, designers, et al., who are doing research. And so I would call that a practice because it's not necessarily like it might not even have a head, head of research, you know, running the show. Um, and so, you know, at Atlassian, um, I worked with people who do research, PWDR is the acronym that, that I coined for, for that kind of cohort of people and researchers, full-time researchers who were part of the broader research team. So, um, yeah, I sort of uh, flip between practice and teams just to try and cover all those bases because it's unfortunate if research operations is tied only to being hired as part of a research team and only looking after the needs of researchers. A research operations team should look after the practice, whatever form that takes of research, which is not just about operationalizing an easier life or a more efficient and effective life for researchers, but also making sure that the research organization, the practice, the team, whatever uh, um, word you want to add to research is delivering value to the people who are in the organization and, and it's perceived, they can see that value, you know, they, they feel it every single day. Um, they're able to find research in a really fantastic searchable library. They're able to come to great product events um, with researchers giving fantastic engaging talks. They're able to like breathe and live what the customer needs are and they're able to do that because research exists. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, amazing to hear this background and also the scope. And I, and I love your focus because it, I always thought that it's like great when companies have user researchers and they have all this knowledge um, about users uh, and insights. But this knowledge, it has to get hum somehow to the people who build the product and, and facilitating it efficient. And, and it has to be efficient because otherwise recipients like PMs have a full schedule, developers, their job is to code. So you can't have an inefficient process and accept, uh, expect them to like stay on top of the latest uh, user needs. So I, I, I love your mission here and the way you, you described it. And um, for, for today's discussion, uh, because the topic is so broad, research jobs, I thought we could focus on a specific element, which is called panels. and. Um, some people in the audience may know, others may not, what a, what a user panel is. So I think let's let's just start by by defining it. Could you give us like a good definition of what a, what a user panel is and what's yeah. the advantage yeah. of having one? Yeah, I was actually writing about this yesterday. A, a user panel is really nothing more than a very organized directory of people. Um, if you were born before the maybe the 1990s, you will recall that we used to have telephone books. And if you wanted to find someone, anyone in the world, you would look in the telephone book. And if you were looking for Kate Towsey, you would look under Towsey, my home number, and you would phone me. Um, now, like a panel is a bit more sophisticated than that, but the ultimate goal is that you can look up for a group of people and find them. Um, you, it, the, the panel will usually have um, a whole lot of demographic data around someone. So um, you wouldn't be looking for Joe Bloggs or Jane Bloggs. You'd be looking for someone who likes to, they're vegan and they um, live in New York and they are aged 18 to 32 and they are male or female or whatever kind of like demographic you're looking for. Um, and you'd be able to filter by that, um, those specific criteria and you'll come up with a list of people. So you get like 100,000, whatever, however big your panel is, people in there. And you can send them a screener um, to then screen down who's available, who's keen to take part in research, and who specifically uses this thing or does that thing, or do you bike to your favorite vegan restaurant on a Saturday morning? You know, I'm making things up here. But that's yeah. really what a panel is. Ultimately, it's, it's about connecting someone who's doing research with a group of people that they want to do research with, the correct people, hopefully, that's the goal, so that they can then actually like have a conversation with people who are living the research topic. They don't have to make things up, and they can really ask them uh, not questions about how they think something might work, but how they've actually worked, how, you know, how something's worked for them in their life. They can't say, uh, you know, if you were to eat a vegan breakfast, I don't know why I'm picking on the vegans today. I used to be vegan, no longer. But, uh, you know, if you, it, it, it's not ifs, it's like when you last ate your vegan breakfast, what did you eat, which is the most valuable kind of research data you can get. It's based on real experience, not um, planned experience. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And is um, is like a panel or having a panel is that something valuable for 
any let's focus on tech companies for now because otherwise it's uh, we're getting into like all the different categories yeah. uh, so for tech companies does it make sense to have a panel for everyone uh, irrespective of the size the maturity b2b mm. b2c focus or are there like groups of companies where a panel is more meaningful to have yeah oh, i've got such strong opinions on this so um the best uh, panels are hard work. A lot of people think, particularly with some fantastic tools that we have available in the world right now, the tools are phenomenal. When I started working in the space, you had to kind of like take a CRM like Salesforce or Sugar CRM or name your CRM, and you'd have to hack it into a panel and it really wasn't built for participant recruitment. Whereas now the world has totally changed and we are so spoiled. However, just because there is a fantastic tool um, available to use doesn't mean that running a panel is easy. It still needs a lot of management. One of the biggest mistakes that people think is that you just kind of pop up a form online with beautiful on your nice corporate website, branded beautifully, marketing teams happy, people start signing up, you send some tweets out and then pop things, some things on LinkedIn, uh, you know, pick your way of, 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 of attracting people and people start signing up and it's happy days. For a short amount of time, it is happy days and it's certainly a happier days than if you had absolutely nothing. But panels are, they are built on, they thrive on truth. It has to be about quality and quantity at the same time. You don't get to choose. There is no point in having like 100,000, 400,000 people in your panel, but only like 350, uh, only 50,000 of those 400,000 are actually who they say they are. Not necessarily because they lied. I'm not, I'm not that uh, crit critical of human society. The people are generally honest, but because life changes, like people move on from their job, they get married, they, you know, like if I use my earlier example, they were vegan, but now they're not. Um, and, and, you know, th things, things, things change over time. And so you have to peel, keep the content fresh in the panel. Otherwise, what happens is any professional panel manager will tell you um, is that uh, so people, they screen, they find a list of fantastic people. Yay, you know, there's 100 people I could screen here. They screen them, but only like you know, two of them come back who are actually that person because they moved on. So there's an enormous amount of, of, of management that goes into keeping the data that sits in the panel fresh and to making sure also that you're holding data in a way that people are aware of what you're holding about them, which is not just about the privacy aspect, which is really important, but also that when you do reach out to ask someone to take part in research, they actually respond because it's not like, like I signed up to like a Vogue panel, like, five years ago. Three years later, I'd totally forgotten and they suddenly invited me to research and I was like, wow, like never heard, never heard from them, not interested anymore. And, and so I'm a dud participant in the panel. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. On that basis, because there's so much work involved in it, it's not just like set it up in happy days. Um, it needs investment and constant, constant investment. You possibly need two people to run a decent sized panel. One person in charge of at least two people, one person, person in charge of data governance, that whole like quality, integrity, but also the privacy piece around it is constantly changing. Um, also someone who's looking at uh, the connections with data in the rest of the organization through APIs, how that works. You don't want to be sitting there as a little puddle on your own. You want to be part of the bigger data lake in your organization. Ideally, that takes work, constant maintenance, but you also need someone who's going to proactively continually build that panel with fresh blood, if you excuse the, the, the term, um, by going out and marketing it always. And in that sense, there should be, you don't want to just pick up anyone out there. If your company is, is selling bicycles, you don't want to pick up like people who have just had babies. You want, although they might ride bicycles, you want to keep, you know, maybe it's keen cyclists. So you're going out to the biking tournaments or whatever it is to go and pick up those sorts of audiences. You need specific um, type of marketing to pick up your most popular cohorts at the moment. Um, so to answer your question, there is because there is so much investment and work that goes into building a panel and it is not the panacea to all participant recruitment qualms, um, it really should be the thing that you actually need to do rather than hiring an agency to do your recruiting for you. The only, the, the most sort of like applicable times is when you are B2B and there is no, it's, it's very difficult for you to get hold of your own customers um, mm -hmm. or it's just like circuitous to go to an agent and ask them now to go and find your own customers for you. When most companies already have a data lake of all of their customers' data, they've got like hopefully really engaged customer, you know, fans and things like that. Um, 
you, like it's best to leverage that. So examples are like companies like Peloton, you know, like enthusiastic biking and fitness people. People love Peloton. I don't know if they still do. Used to. I'm sure they still do. You know, it's a strong brand. You look at something like Squarespace for web designers. Um, a lot of people really into Squarespace is all the developers and everything. Um, you know, I used to work for Atlassian, very strong um, fan base. And so this is the kind of, you can leverage that kind of fan base, those internal customers that an agent, like a recruitment agency would have a tricky time finding. They're going to have to like go around the block 50 times to get them. Whereas these guys are like on your doorstep. Uh, one of the caveats to that is that you don't just want fans in your panel. People who just love your product or hate your product. You want also some more neutral folk in there. So you can have some more sort of uh, neutral conversations yeah. as part of your research. So those are the main things I would say with a panel. Number one, don't assume that just because there are fantastic tools out there that they don't require a huge amount of investment to make them valuable. Initially, they could be valuable, but over time, panels go to rot if you don't constantly um, service them and, and keep them fresh. The second thing, you'd think of them like a, a pond in your garden. If you just leave it sitting there, it's going to go rancid over time. So you want to you want to keep like looking after it and make it nice and fresh and friendly. Um, the second thing is, is that um, if if an agent can can find these people easily for you, let them do it. It's cheaper. It's much less work. It's much more efficient. It's cheaper. But if your people are living on your doorstep and they're your customers and it's tricky for anyone else to get hold of them, like do it yourselves. And then a panel is a very good move. Yeah, I have a question on the on, on maintaining the panel because uh, I get all the all the tasks that you can do internally with APIs and checking. But uh, regularly, you also need to reach out to customers and get fresh data from them to see if whatever data you have in the database is still uh, still up to date. Um, and like, how, what what is the good practice to not annoy? your your panel participants but but still have the have a certain confidence level that that your data is legitimate uh, and mm. it's um it's i would say at least at least once a year now i'm going to caveat this and the reason i hesitate is because i'm not a professional panel manager i know a lot about them but i'm sure that there you know there could be someone listening to this who works for a massive panel agency um and they're like this is their full-time job that's what all they do um, but, you know, for running an in-house panel, at least once a year, you want to reach out to people and make sure that they, their data is correct and give them the opportunity to be able to correct it. The tricky thing with that is that uh, panels don't always offer the opportunity for someone to access all of their data and see what you've got. Um, and so it's like you need to be like, this is what we've got about you. And is it still correct? Um, and that's not always possible to do that. So what most people tend to do is, is look at people who are just constantly not like they're non-responsive. And then you need to clean those people out of your panel. Uh, same as when you run a community. I run communities if, um, or a community, a club. But um, if, if people haven't been responding to any messages or engaging at all with, with anything, then I take them as being non-responsive after six months to 12 months and I'll, I'll delete them out. Um, you, you might send someone a nice message to say, we've noticed that you're not responding. We can assume that you're, you're no longer keen to be a part of the panel. Um, we're going to archive your profile. So there's a variety of, of ways that you can deal with that, but it's not very often that you can kind of show everybody the data you've got about, the, about them and ask them to correct it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a last question uh, for you. And um, so the way you described like the, the resources needed to run a good panel, like two, two people, it sort of necessitates a certain budget that, that the company has. And that indicates it's typically not a smaller company, but more like a profitable, bigger, bigger, bigger company or a company with bigger budget. Now, for all the, all the companies out there and teams who don't have the budget to, to like maintain a panel, What's the second best thing uh, mm. to do for them? Yeah, so I've always got a caveat because I'm I, certainly when you're looking at operations, I tend to work at really big scales. I look at like hundreds of people and particularly in recruitment, I'm looking at 100 researchers, several hundred people who do research and the recruiting needs of product managers are very different from designers, are very different from researchers. And so you really are needing a panel that does different things. Product managers tend to want to like, you know, have a chat with a customer once a week, and that's a legitimate way of recruitment need, but it's not the same as researchers who want to, you know, they need to recruit a cohort of eight 
at least participants to take part in their study. They're very different technologies, actually, and very different different technical needs. Um, so that said, if you are small, like, you know, use these amazing tools that are available to build a panel. You're not going to necessarily lose initially, but it's, it's, it's important to make sure that you don't um, think that what you've got is scalable. Like it will work fantastically at a small scale. Like if you've got 10 researchers who are working on similar products and they need to all speak to, I'll go back to my vegans in New York who ride bicycles and like breakfast. If that's what they're generally researching and, and then fantastic, set up a panel for vegans in New York who like breakfast and ride bicycles. You're going to have a great time. If you're working for a huge enterprise that has 16, 15, 20 different products Within those products, they want to research dark mode one week, and then two weeks later, they're not interested in dark mode. They've like solved that problem. They want to research like something completely different, calendarizing. I, you know, who knows? You make up your thing. Um, there's so much diversity involved in that that having one big pool of randoms is just it's going to be less satisfying than satisfying, and you're actually going to lose efficiency because people are wasting their time fishing in a pond when they're looking for trout or salmon, and they're picking up octopus all the time. Or they're picking up nothing because the pond has been overfished. There's nothing in there. They just can't see that. And so instead of being efficient, you're actually causing inefficiency by advertising that you've got this like all singing, all dancing, solve all, all recruiting problems panel, when really what you've got is a pond of octopus. Or is it octopi? I think it's octopus. <laughs> so this is the thing to watch out for. If you've got a specific yeah. audience that you want to recruit and you've got 10 researchers who all want to speak to that audience, knock yourself out. Use one of these fantastic tools, build your panel, you're going to be super happy. The moment someone now wants to speak to meat eaters who live in like Philadelphia or Sydney, where I live, um, things are going to become tricky because they're not going to find anyone who fits that criteria in your other pond of yeah, vegans who yeah, ride bicycles yeah. in New York. So that's really what to look out for. All right. So Kate, Kate uh, thanks so much for the for all the wisdom and the stories and the and the vegan example. I think it's <laughs> I, I love these examples and stories because they're a good way to recall concepts and and approaches. So I appreciate you sh sharing this. And honestly, there's so much more to unpack. I I hope to see you back on the show like uh, sometime in the future. And before we move on, there's just one thing I also wanted to like mention. You're writing a book, you know, that's, uh, that's something that you mentioned in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, you see my bookshelf uh, up here. My question is, uh, do you have like an idea when we, can, uh, when we can have it on the bookshelf and what it's about? Uh, yeah, sure. It's called Research That Scales, and it's about how to scale research and uh, with research operations. Um, so it's Research That Scales, the Research Ops Handbook. And it will be published uh, next year, hopefully early next year, all being well by Rosenfeld Media. Um, so yeah, it should be should be out uh, sometime. I hope within the first quarter of next year. I'm I'm busy rewriting the first uh, two chapters again, and uh, and then it's pretty much done. Fantastic. Then crossing my fingers uh, for for like a, a publishing early next year. And uh, and thanks, Kate, uh, for being here and uh, sharing your thoughts and wisdom. It's my absolute pleasure. I'm happy to come again.